Okay, so um, Silent Eagle, the soul of the entrepreneur, life beyond the spreadsheet. Well, it's a privilege and it's an honor. I have, could call him a little bit of a national treasure actually, um, Chris Foote, alias Ray Carroll, Special Forces, SBS, SAS, SBS. He's done them both. But not only that, he's the guy that selects the best of the best. What a story and what a treat to have him present today to talk about his life's journey. Um, he's an entrepreneur. He's an author. He's uh, basically an adventurer and he's planning his next adventure. Well, actually, he's got a couple of adventures coming up, uh, which I'm going to let him talk about. But Chris, um, a pleasure to meet you. Welcome. And we're in for a treat. So let's start with that big question. How did it all begin? I believe you wanted to be a tennis coach. I did, and just listening to you then, Paul, um, I thought you were talking about someone else, in all honesty. It's <laughs> just a recap to sort of, yeah, how far I've sort of come in life. Yeah, yeah, the tennis coach uh, piece. Um, as a kid, I was a sport billy, played sports for, you know, um, a number of different sports for the county, Dorset or Wiltshire. And yeah, I just loved um, tennis, really. Um, I knew I wasn't good enough to be a pro, but I sort of had this idea of, I don't know, sort of teaching board housewives, uh, maybe, in uh, little white <laughs> skirts, etc. And obviously, clearly, I like the, the white tennis shorts. So yeah, I literally, I genuinely, 13, 14 years of age, I thought I was literally going to be knocking tennis balls um, at the local sort of wow. tennis club um, for the sort of foreseeable future. Um, and then... All things changed when I moved from Salisbury um, to Paul. Right. Um, in how did that change? I then just sort of taken up rugby a lot more seriously. I've never really been like a really aggressive or violent person, but I was very good. I was county level rugby player. Getting towards that point of 14, 15 years of age, you know, what do I do with life? Um, big inspiration. We all don't remember the book Bravo 2 Zero. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I mean, how drawn I was into that and another little story. I was going to the southwest of England rugby trials at um, Chichester and I was in the passenger seat, obviously, uh, with my dad. And I was engrossed in this book. I was just turning pages. My dad's asking me questions about, you know, to do with the rugby the upcoming trials. You know, dad obviously wants me to be a professional rugby player. Right. And I'm just, you know, I'm not interested in all honesty. I mean, and I get to the <laughs> trials. Um, and if I'm being honest, I just wanted to get the game over because I wanted to get stuck back into the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that happens. Um, sort of. So I had a an idea that maybe the military was the way it wanted to be. Um, but it's my dad. Uh, he was really okay. took over that mentoring role then. He would served a little bit of time in the RAF um, years ago. And he was just like, hey, son, you know, you're, you're physical, you're sporty. You know, the forces, they look after you. You know, they feed you. They give you a home. You've got a great bunch of blokes. Um, how about looking at the forces? Um, and I was like, yeah. Um, and initially, I sort of, at school, went to the sort of the, what was like the careers part. Um, I was just looking at art, brought some army brochures home. You know, yeah, and, and then Dad's just like, "No, it's the Royal Marines is is what you want to be doing." And right. I was just like, well, "Who are the Royal Marines?" I was thinking I heard of the Paras, and um, yeah, um, got me a magazine about the Royal Marines. Um, there's loads of small little stories that sort of come out of there. This magazine called The Challenge on the front, and these three really grisly knuckle dragging. They just look hard, and I've sort of. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't mind being a bit of that. <laughs> Long story cut short, one of the actual guys who's about 10 years older than me who was on the cover of that magazine, we're probably best of friends these days. Oh, one nice. of my very close circle of friends. Um, another small story, his brother is my best friend from the magazine. We met at the rugby trials. Right. But in a minibus back, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I want to join the Marines. Oh, I want to join the Marines as well. Right. I've got three brothers in the Marines. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. So me and him then created this bond of friendship where for the next three years, me and him were just in each other's back pockets, um, training like maniacs. And we had one mission, one mission only. And that was become Royal Marine Commandos and look as hard as those blokes on the front of that magazine. And you did it. Yep. So we joined the Marines. Yeah, um, it was. Yeah, initially, actually, it was dad wanted me to go in as an officer. Um, I was supposed to start me A levels and go down that route, but I just. Um, and how old were you? Sixteen. So that was yeah, sixteen. Left school at sixteen. So I said, no, I'm not doing the A levels. Didn't turn up. Um, applied for the Marines straight away. Sort of bit me in the backside a little bit because there was a huge waiting list then for the Royal Marines. So I could have actually right. done me A levels. So 
went to Germany, went to Leipzig, uh, Alvi the same pet style with uh, a couple of people that I knew because I was a plasters labourer at the time. Right. Went out there for about six months, earning an 800 pound a week. Literally, Dad's thinking, how am I going to get him back? You know, he's earning that sort of money. I remember lending Dad 700 quid to buy a new car when I was out there. And obviously, I was sort of, mm, do I want to join the Marines now? I'm earning all this money. Um, right. Maybe there's futures out here. But no, the the passion and desire was there. I, you know, it was in, ingrained in my mind. The Marines was where I was going. So come back um, from that. And then, obviously looked at joining the Marines, said goodbye to dad at uh, Salisbury uh, train station, um, shaking like a leaf, really. This yeah. was me, you know, dad's obviously, you know, he's glad to get rid of me. Um, I'm sort of, the realisations hit me that this is the journey. I'm about to start it. I'm nervous. Wow. I really don't want to get on the train. Um, like every person who goes through that sort of experience, knowing it's the unknown. It's not knowing mm. what the unknown is. You, you know, get an idea of what you're getting into, but... It was a lonely journey. It was a horrific journey. So the adventure started then. It definitely did, yeah, absolutely. And was this around about ninety six or? Yeah, so nineteen. Uh, yeah, it was April nineteen ninety. April the fifteenth, nineteen ninety six. Um, that was. Yeah, the journey into the you know the Royal Marines and you know you people sort of asking what was Marine training like and obviously a long time ago. It's an extraordinary long time ago, and it was. It was. It was that process in life which turns you into the spotty little teenager who knows absolutely nothing about life, even though you think you know everything. And it's how over a nine-year period, I'm not going to say they beat it out of you, but you then take this transformation of boy to man um, in learning just the critical skills um, yeah. um, in yourself about you know this teamwork, about this bond, this band of brothers, um, going through such a painful experience that this is how it moulds you all together. Um, so when I sort of talk about training, sort of people like to hear about you know, the action bits and you know the firing weapons and you know playing soldiers in the sort of field. But when people when people look back, it isn't. It's it's the people you meet. It's you realise in this transition in life now. Mm is you're stood side by side people now that effectively you're going to go to war with. Now, you probably find that if you ask anyone, why did they join the Marines? Now, none of them will sort of give you the, well, yeah, I want to go to war, don't I? I want to kill people. Mm. That doesn't really exist. That's the byproduct of being a part of the military that you will get sent and you want to get sent away somewhere at some point, obviously. Right. Um, but no, the experience is while you were just joining a new family, I just sort of, left one which was you know my parents and you know my brother and I just joined this whole new dysfunctional family I'd probably call it <laughs> um, meeting all these different people all these different accents um, and it's a good leveler you then realize you're not the smartest person in the world I was about to say you're not the fittest but I actually was the fittest um, and you know you're not the cleverest um, and you realize that there's a whole, you know there's a bigger world outside of Bournemouth yeah, um, and yeah. you've got all these amazing characters. Which... It's 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 an interesting point, isn't it, uh, Chris? I mean, I'm going to come on a little bit further on about you know the the the, the, the special forces elements mm. of it and the likes. But it's something I was talking to somebody about um, a few days ago about national service. Mm. Um, and I know we don't do that here right now. Mm. But if I look at some of the sort of like street challenges that we have mm. now in society. You know, that kind of those that are, you know, leaving school at mm. 16 and haven't truly got a job or a vocation. There's nothing better than a good grounding in the military for, you know, three or four years mm. just to put the what you classified mm. as the brilliant basics of life. Mm. Yeah, how to become a little bit more self-reliant, self-resilient mm. and equally a kind of that unity, you know, joining a group of people mm -hmm. like minded and. You know, you build that camaraderie, yeah. don't you? You know, no, I think there's a lot of that's actually missing yeah. today. And I know we're not talking, I know we're talking like, you know, mid 90s mm -hmm. now, but I know that you, you know, somewhere on this journey ended up getting super fit in the Marines. And then obviously mm -hmm. you started to step forward into what became, you know, you're, yeah. you're joining, going to Hereford. I think that's the yeah, term. Yeah, and I think what you touched on then is when you talk about society and bringing back national service, it's a sense of purpose as well. When you join that organization, right. It's almost, as we know, the big struggle for a lot of people is, you know, what am I here for? What am I here to do? It's quite easy when you talk to join the, an organised institution like the Marines because they pretty much, the vision and the focus, they, they've sorted that for you. Yeah. You, you, you know, you're just a part of this ever-evolving huge machine. You're a small cog 
um, you don't really need to think about those big questions. Those big questions are already sort of answered for you. Mm. Um, but definitely, I think it just gives you, you know, that self-respect for yourself. It gives you the, the discipline, the small things in life, um, the small sort of life skills. And it just sets you off. It gives you a great foundation. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we'd ever be able to bring national service yeah. <laughs> into, you know, into place. But yeah, I can say now that that year of my life really set, set my stall out for how I act, behave, um, my respect towards other people. Mm -hmm. um, and the key thing is is those relationships, which are just, you know, unbounding. You know, um, yeah. all my best friends are... 80% of the guys that I either met in the Marines or met yeah. within the sort of special forces uh, community. Well, I think that's great. I mean, coming over today in the car, and I mean, we all talk about this, but, you know, we should have done the podcast. But what what is stuck with me even now when we're kicking this off is your authenticity. Mm. You, you are very original in how you've pursued your uh, line of travel. And I know we, we're not through by any stretch. Mm. You know, we're still at 2000 where we mm. meet, you know, we, we go into the special services and the things which I'd like to talk about. But that integrity, the discipline, the purpose, mm. those that, that hallmark that, I, you know, we haven't known each other a long time, but it's certainly something I've picked up very, very quickly, that middle ground guy. Because if, if you don't mind me saying this, that there's a lot of kind of particularly special service guys mm. now kind of kind of becoming a bit rock star like, which yeah. is you, you just don't enter that sort of <laughs> terrain. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's an interesting point. It's um, it's alien to me, or certainly alien to say that it's twenty years ago that it's either that, or maybe I, I didn't read the script, or I didn't read that <laughs> particular part of the agreement where you know when you leave sort of the special forces, you then sort of become a celebrity, or you you, you go on TV. That was sort of uh, very alien to me, and it's at the moment um, it's very diluted and. Um, as yeah, we talked about in the car about you know we've got the TV series out there and you know you mentioned whether you know I would like to talk, you know, be on TV and it's not um, authenticity passion and desire I know exactly what I want to do in life mm -hmm. I know how I've got an idea of how I should represent say the SAS being a former member um, and again that's also having respect for myself respect for that organisation in personally um, to be front and centre, sort of you know, bottling up SAS sort of stuff and selling it is, it's just not me. Okay, I know I've picked up a huge amounts of experiences in life through that organisation. Um, in as long as I deliver or impart some of the knowledge, um, which was in what I say within keeping of the you know, within the keeping of the game, for instance, you know, you've yeah. got to get on sort of the gentleman sort of stuff. Yes. Then I'm 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 happy. I can't get away from the fact that. I was in that organisation. But that's one of four or five things, big things I've done in my life. Correct. Um, and that's the way, and you've got to be genuine, you know. Um, as I spoke said about before, what we don't want to get involved in is when you really start selling that brand is you asking me questions and me giving you the answer. And you also notice my voice is changing a bit more now <laughs> because you're expecting the answer that you expect the special forces, yeah. knuckle-dragging sort yeah. of dealer of death to give you yeah um and then also you probably expect me to act yeah. the way you think yeah. these guys act and yeah. if you sort of fall into that sort of trap where you've got to sort of put that persona out there then you're you're doing a disservice not only to yourself but you're doing a disservice to that organization which is really prides itself on um privacy um and but, but what i'm doing yeah sure we're touching on that it's there it's, you can't get away from the SAS, you know, obviously I was a part of it, but the way I sort of tread through life, I know what I want to do. Um, yeah. People which, know what the background is. But. Which, 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 which we'll come on to. So, I mean, it, I think for our listeners and viewers uh, today, we, we, what we're really trying to say is, and I think that it, I picked it up with Chris is, it, believe it or not, in 2000, when you, you made, so you were going in, you, you were selected for the SAS, I believe. You were one of the youngest guys, if not the youngest guy to be selected is that correct yeah so in uh, i'm not gonna you know there's there is a process you sort of apply or you're recommended to go for selection um again it goes down to where you start off in life really when i joined the marines i wanted to be to the pinnacle of where i could be in soldiering that was in the special forces so again i was that person knocking on my sort of senior's door you know can i i'm ready can i go yet can i go yet no you know you're you know you're too young 
got to get a couple more years behind you. You were 21 when you got it there. Yeah, so I started the process 21. i just done a tour of Northern Ireland. It was always big then to, you know, done your tour in Northern Ireland, um, your operational tour. Even it's relatively quiet. I think the only incident we had was a bit of a scrap outside a pub um, <laughs> once. <laughs> I think that was it, really, thankfully. Um, and then, yeah, someone then is pretty much, give me the green light, okay, um, here's, the, here's the process. And again, I was, yeah, 21 years of age. Wow. Um, initially going into, you know, trying to attempt to get into the Premier League, I suppose. Um, and, you know, and that's exactly where that sort of journey started. Did you straight in, Chris? Did you, did you make it straight away? Yeah, so, um, again, um, I did a winter selection, which is January 2000. Uh, the course is six months long, depending on who you speak to. Yeah, <laughs> some people say it's 9, 10, 11 months. It's six months solid, um, you know, a, a very... A course which is a mixed bag, you know, you've got elements of individualist stuff, which is like a month of endurance, and you've got a lot of uh, sort of jungle skills or tactical, really getting into the meat of what soldiering is all about. And again, there's a, there's a good saying, which I, in the future, when I went on to teach, it was like, you know, there's the instructors should say there's easier ways to impress your girlfriends. So, what you find when you've got 250 odd guys um, wanting to be in the SAS. Too many people look at the glossy pictures, they see the embassy siege, they've got this sort of fantasy idea of them sort of being a part of this organisation. But forgetting the journey to get into it, you know, it's hard work, it's mm -hmm. boring as well. A lot of it is absolutely painstakingly boring because right. which makes the prize at the end all the more sort of worthwhile. Mm. So a very tough selection. Um, again, I'm not being biased, just, just the way the selection is is. The phases is certainly, I think, it's probably the hardest selection in the world. Definitely. I know that, and that's not being biased. And I did it first time. Um, so come out the end, sort of July. Um, I remember it well, July 2006, because, sorry, 2000, because there's 15 of my mates were all on a holiday in Ibiza. Um, <laughs> I couldn't go because I was on selection. Again, I was waiting for my first holiday. Yeah. They were all having a great time, but I was. Yeah, obviously wouldn't change it in July. I had sort of passed out and, you know, got my sort of beige berry, you know. Um, yeah. How did it feel? Young um, guy, 21, quite surreal, huh? No, not really. It's, um, it's, it's like <laughs> anything in life. You speak to anyone who sort of achieves stuff, it's always an anti-climax, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's a very low-level thing. When you pass out in the Marines, you've got your family there, you've got every man and his dog, you know, your, your girlfriends, your ex-girlfriends. Um, they're all there to see you sort of, you know, march off the parade square. Um, the SAS is completely different. It's, I, I remember reading books when I was 14, 15 of this sort of saying of the commanding officer gives you your beret and he says, you know, it's going to be harder to keep it than it was to earn it. Now, I thought that was sort of like urban, wow. urban myth. And, you know, lo and behold, it was July in an auditorium, just about, I think it was about 20 of us or maybe less than that. Yeah, literally walked up, shook the commanding officer's hand. Those Before he told us those sort of iconic words... <laughs> <laughs> and it was yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, and whether they do that on every um, sort of selection, I, I don't know. But yeah, and there you go. There's your bear. You saw, you saw a lot of action, didn't you? It, yeah, I mean, I sort of joined a very busy period, and I think you, you could call it the golden era, really. Um, again, once, you know, the Twin Towers fell, you know, it really opened up a hornet's nest. And so from, the, from 2000, and I was in to 2009 so it's almost a decade yeah so again is is you know the two main campaigns we knew were afghanistan um it was iraq a load of other stuff happens around the world which you know may come out in the future i don't know i uh, don't really care so yeah very busy really high tempo and there's lots of sort of books being written on that particular phase of the sort of the British sort of special forces sort of era in very high intensity, very, you know, you're talking four to six month tours um, and it's high intensity, um, you know, insurgency sort of warfare. Um, you know, anyone knows, you know, about Iraq, it's sort of the sort of the irony of the conflict was where I was a part of the organisation that was probably first in. Mm -hmm. We thought this is going to be a sort of a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, um, you know, change, change the regime, bit of a regime change. Um, you know, shoot back home for tea and medals, the old sort of classic Blackadder stuff. Um, and then you sort of, you know, 2008, you're still sort of knocking around. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, you've just, obviously at this point, observing how things have changed, how it went from, you know, a simple sort of idea of a regime change into this yeah. whole, you know, this whole insurgency from, you know, Al-Qaeda, Iraq through to ISIS, you know. So, wow. a, 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 you know, a huge campaign in the end. Um, mm. So great to be a part of that, part of that regimental history. Because mm -hmm. there's a hell of a lot in there. 
in great, it's born great experience, great knowledge. I wouldn't say wisdom yet. Maybe in 10, 15 years, I yeah. might take away the more sort of, I don't know, so it's, um, the philosoph- philosophical sort of side of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, most importantly, um, an, an era which I was unscathed mm-hmm. um, is that's mentally um, a few little wounds here and there physically. Um, but yeah, it was a, a, a an iconic decade of my life. That's for mm. sure. And you and you did SAS, SBS, but you also became a a, 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 a selection. Uh, you know, you, you made a grade where you were actually. Um, selecting the, uh, the, the, the future. Yeah, so when you've done about six or seven years of in the regiment, in like any organisation, you, you then know exactly what you're doing. Um, you're a leader. Um, yeah, they, 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 the, the SAS, yeah, naturally, if anything, they want to select the people who are then going to spend two years training up the, the new candidates, you know, the, the, the six-month selection courses. So it's called directing staff. Uh, so, yeah, done two years there. So obviously responsible for, you know, it's one of those amazing things where you go full circle. You're sort of now in a big room where you've got the 250 guys who are all nervous, you know, knowing right. that they're about to embark on, you know, their biggest challenge of their life. You're there after six or seven sort of years of experience now looking at them. Is they're all looking at each other, trying to work out, you know, what's he like? Am I better than him? And, yeah. and then, you know, you've, what, what, you've... What's the secret, Chris? Come on, after all that experience, what, what's the, what do you look for? It's, it's hard. So people will ask this question and uh, everyone likes data, don't they? So they think that you've got all these different sort of attributes, um, you know, whether it's like discipline, motivation or skills and capabilities, how intelligent someone is. Um, again, it's like anything. It's hard to describe. You see it. You Do know? you? Yeah. So the, the way the selection process works is you get rid of all the crap. Okay. In in, in people just fail themselves. It's right. not really until we get to a certain part of selection where you're under the microscope. So we can get rid of out of the two fifty, the dross is gone. The people who is a pipe dream, we've got rid of them. All people are injured, and now we've got you know whether it's fifty or sixty. Um, you know, we're only five or six weeks into the course. Now we can start working with people. Now. I'm not going to sort of bore you with the fact we know you've got to be fit. We know you're be motivated, determined. We know you have this discipline. You've got to be intelligent. You know, we don't take idiots. That's for sure. Um, but you see it. You feel it. When you watch someone um, over a real intense period of time, you see them evolving. And again, it's a very responsible position. So we're not there to watch someone make a mistake. And, you know, you're not good enough. Off you go. Okay, you're watching characters evolve. How do they evolve under pressure? When you're mm. really on their back, like niggling away at them. How do they evolve? How do they handle it? Okay. Mm. The main sort of, um, the crux of it all, the question is very simple, isn't it? You're like, okay, can I work with this person? But I'm not looking at working with this person on my level. Can I have this person in my team as a junior member, right. as a new member? Okay. Has he got the basics? Now, I was taught on my selection, again, and it's wisdom from other people. You know, SAS selection, it's, it's hard. you just got to do the basics well. Be consistent. Do the basics well. And obviously, you've got all the other attrition and the physical side of it. But anyone who gets through selection, it's because they want it. They want it enough. It's like, with me, it's the pinnacle. I'm going to do everything I can do to get where I want to be. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to fail myself. It's up to the instructors to fail me. As much how bad I'm doing, interesting. I'm not going to psych myself out. Okay, there's mm. someone else is going to press that button. Button, you know, the Graham Norton red chair. Someone's going to get me out of here. So I'm not going to do it myself. Right. So I'm just going to keep going, keep going. And I was a young lad, so um, blank canvas really. I had no yeah. bad habits. I didn't have an attitude. Um, I just pretty much was the grey man. Just got my head got down. Um, done everything that's asked of me. Absolutely. Um, people s- squeeze me a bit with pressure. And this was all stuff that you know, I'd done as an, as an instructor. So as opposed to an attitude, we call it creeping excellence in the business. It's like when you get the opportunity to then select other people, your standards suddenly then become higher than what actually you know yours was back in the day. You know, you, you're trying to get people to have a standard which was above what you had to achieve. So you just got to be very objective, um, 
don't let any sort of personality get in the way of people because there's people you you know there's people I've worked with you work with now you don't like mm. but you you get on with it yeah but I just you just see it you you just get this sense over it's you like imagine, an instinct yeah yeah absolutely so over the period of you know you say you get into the last sort of two three months you know you know who who's worthy you know you've got the guys now that you want and you yeah. you, you don't want them to fail there are obstacles to trip them up uh, if they fall short of that then it wasn't meant to be but you do you just get this warm feeling yeah that's a good guy we can mold him he's mm. got the basics he's got everything we need so we can take him in and then we can really start developing that person exactly the same as what i was i was still a when i passed i was 22 years old wow i was still shy i wouldn't say boo as goose i still had acne um didn't know really anything about Life, in all honesty, I was intimidated by this new environment I'd come into. Was I worthy enough here? You're looking around, and I'm sort of still this young mm. sort of lad now in the SAS. So, but then it's taking that experience and realising, okay, that guy there, no, he's not the full package, we know that. But he's got absolutely the solid, basic fundamentals that we need. So I would classify um, that in my language uh, as the brilliant basics. Yeah. The, the fundamentals, the core is sound, yeah. and we can build off that. Yeah. If we have a fractured core, we've got a problem, mm. but we've got stability in that core, he's in, etc. So just moving on, because you know this is fascinating stuff, there's this sort of line of integrity right through this, this authenticity, mm. uh, Chris, which you, you ooze, and that sort of originality. Mm. You've not wavered, and you know I'm talking <laughs> futures here, because I know we've got a little bit to get through, but mm. equally... Um, what, what what happened when you ended up going down to SBS land? Because you SAS and and SBS and yeah, because so, so, there was a bit of a yeah. bit of a journey and a bit yeah. of a baptism there, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, we sort of said yeah, sort of like it's my real proper you know um, sort of hero to zero story really. Um, right. and, and I know we're sort of press for time now. I initially was going to go for the SBS. Um, before you go for the SBS, you do like a really hardcore two week aptitude course where you've got to get thrown into diving. Um, yep. without really much instruction um, and you've got to do some really nails tests and that doesn't happen anymore but as I sort of said once before that that particular diving test to me every time I come up it felt like I'd just undergone a CIA waterboarding um, wow. session because wow. I was just um, just not doing things right I was breathing in you know the, the concept of breathing in air instead of water didn't quite sink into my head <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. I made things really difficult but but longer the short I finished that course and it was a case of, look, you need more diving if you want to go direct for the SBS or if you really hate diving, you know, your ears bleed, your nose bleed, maybe diving's not for you, you can start off going for the SAS. Now, the course is the same for both. Yes. But you have to decide at the start. So I decided to go SAS. So three, four years forward, I live in Paul anyway. I said, actually, geographically, the next 15 years... Actually, it makes sense that I, you know, transferred to the SBS. And I've got all my mates down there, girlfriends down there. So I then uh, made the painful decision um, to do that. Um, again, a lot of objection, if you can imagine. You know, I'm probably the first bloke ever in like the SAS history that who wants to actually transfer to the, you know, I say not the enemy. <laughs> there's, a, there's a massive um, competitive sort of rivalry there, healthy rivalry. Um, yeah, so went down there just after Iraq as well. I had a, a, a really good experience in Iraq. It's a good experience. It was a successful campaign for us. And then it was just a case, case of character clash. You know, I had a lot of experience, a lot of senior characters. Um, we just didn't get on. That happens in life, really. Um, and again, I was very vocal. I'd found my feet by this part. You know, yeah. I'd gone from the shy guy again and to mm -hmm. being someone who knows something, who's got a lot of experience. So without delving into it too much, I sort of, from being a hero, within two months of joining the SBS, I was in front of my commanding officer, who's now telling me that, you know, there's been a few problems with the trip to Botswana or wherever we were on a training exercise. Um, you you. You know, you're rubbing people up the wrong way. You probably got a lack of respect for, you know, authority. Um, it wasn't. Oh. It was just a character clash. I wasn't being. I felt I wasn't being listened to. But it doesn't matter what the point is. I went from up there, down there, in a space of two months. I was a six month warning, which meant you mess up again. That's it. You're out. Um, so I wasn't happy about that. And then inside my mind, it just imploded. I just couldn't understand how have I. I'm now in a position where I'm questioning myself i've got all this catastrophic thinking actually 
are you a knob? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Is it actually me? Is it, am I the only person who doesn't get this? And and again, so um, except it, it um, affected my self belief. Um, really, wow. a, a real confidence knock. I mean, no confidence. You can lose it and gain it fast. Again, I just wasn't the person I was. I was a shell of that person to the point where I put in to leave the actual military. I just I thought I'm not being treated the way I don't deserve this. I want to leave. And it wasn't until, you know, I was talking about mental shit where I then got put in a, 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 a never squadron with a new ne- never leadership. And it wasn't until I just got sat down with someone who just could see through the whole facade of what had happened. And he was just, look, we know you're a quality guy. We've spoken. We know all the people that know you up in Hereford. Look, you've taken a knock. You might feel you've got the sort of like the, the, the sort of the, the rough deal. But look, just concentrate on the basics again, which would be, uh, you know, a, a, a point we keep crossing. You know, you know um, what you're capable of. Um, you just got to keep your head down and mm. just find your feet again. And mm. the real big one is as much as you're sort of a 25, 26 year old sort of, you know, uh, SAS corporal. You know, and you expect me to lean on someone within the organisation for advice. It wasn't. It was good old on the phone to dad. Right. You're you know, your so dad, dad's right. probably on a building site putting a door up somewhere because he's a chippy. And I'm just sort of phoning them up and say, you know, telling them that, look, you know, I'm just that I'm broken at the moment. Um, I'm just this is the worst decision I ever made in my life. And I put my notice in to leave. And his words were, look, son, he goes, your quality. He goes, you know your quality. I know your quality. He goes, and you can't suppress quality. He goes, what a message. Yeah. And he said, just get your head down and just get on with it. Just, you know, don't cause any problems. Don't react to anything. Mm. Just, you know, keep plowing forward again and it will all come good. And good old dad. Um, I've asked him for lots more advice you know, since then, obviously, and a bit of cash here and there. Um, <laughs> it worked. That was what, what happened um, and ended up having a phenomenal time um, down at Pool. Yeah. But to sort of end it, instead of me transferring to the SBS, I then had a two year posting. So I was sort of almost lent out by the regiment to Pool for two years. Um, and then after two years, I then sort of went back um, mm. sort of up the road, really. Um, so a great, a great life in, you know, the special forces and, you know, joining at a very young age, uh, you know, staying steady and and how you've harnessed a lot of those skills now as you've started to sort of move into being an adventurer. And mm-hmm. I know that you've, um, you know, you've skied to the North Pole after leaving the, the mm-hmm. SAS. And I think yeah. just, just before we kind of move on, just very quickly... You know, that self-reliance, but equally just reaching out to your, your cut, the mentor that in some respects influenced you to go in, mm. which is your dad. Yeah. And uh, always been there as that rock to lean on right at yeah. the 11th hour. Yeah. Which is uh, which is really nice and, you know, mm. a, a great, but a, an excellent career there. And yeah. you're left with some super skills, the brilliant mm. basics. You've kept a steady nerve. Mm. You know, you've, you've, you've got that sort of originality to mm. you. And yeah. uh, that's, that's coming out in space. But, you know, you switched into being, you know, transferring those skills to skiing away to the North Pole. And I know that you've, you know, you've done a lot of adventures mm. and then, you know, you switched over to Dubai. I mean, tell us a little bit about that. And then I'm, I'm really keen to reach on to the, um, to bring in Ray, Ray Carroll. Yeah. Who, who is, you, you know, uh, uh, your character in, uh, you know, the books and, yeah. and Decker and the clinic. Absolutely, yeah. You're the author, you know, yeah. you spun it all up to become an entrepreneur yeah. as well. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. Wow, and it's all come out of this sort of yeah. nine years in yeah. in action. But these core skills, how you were transferring them out. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, before we get to Dubai, there's there was a motive to go into Dubai, and just quickly, I I I, I left early, um, and which and was like, wow, wow, why you're leaving at the peak of your career? I'm just impulsive, and you'll, you'll get that. I I go for something. I'm very stubborn. Um, again, it's either a good trait or a bad trait. I'm stubborn. I know what I want, and I go and get it. I got into expeditions because I I just missed the void. Of right. elitism right. I knew that it was just you know, and I use it and it's a fear of normality I still have that now a fear of normality a fear of everyone's got their own normal and I just don't like my normal so I've got to up my game and naturally um, endurance events to sort of north south poles it just sort of floated my boat I got involved in a 500 mile race to the magnetic north pole Wow! once I was doing that I realised because the hi- conditions were hideous and I was leading I was with a, a, a girl Leanne I knew I could do this on my own. Um, and then I got involved in Antarctic stuff. And now at one time, there was a record. No one had ever walked to the South Pole and back on their own. It's 1,430 miles. So, again, I was like, oh, I'm having some of that. 
Probably didn't have the confidence to do it, but I had a chat with a never mentor at Ottawa Airport um, he, and mentioned it to him. And I said, what, how many years training do I need? He went, nah, do it now. He goes, that's a load of old crap about having to do a year and a half. He goes, you're good to go and you want to do it this year because someone else is going to do it. So that was it. Mine made up, you know, moleskin on the plane back strategy. How am I going to do this? Raised the money, uh, got down to Antarctica to do the expedition, delayed three weeks. So I got the 715 miles to the pole. Didn't have enough time to come back because it's a seasonal base camp. Um, so come back and then hence I went to Dubai, not out of any reason to enjoy sun, you know, sand and sea. It was I was in massive debt. Right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, Let's get real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, exactly. It was, um, it was, yeah. So I mean, those expeditions are like 100 grand each. I probably got, wow. about, I probably got about, about 60 odd plus sponsorship and then the rest was footed by good old dad again. Um, and then we had credit cards, we had loans, we had all sorts. Because the idea being, if I yeah. succeeded, um, then I'd probably made that back through, you know, um, whether it's not like writing books, but I'd have made it back through maybe a bit of a keynote or something like that. So, uh, yeah, out to Dubai, really, um, to literally pay off um, the debt that I had obviously occurred. Um, and I was out there just doing consultancy, um, you know, again, for their, for their sort of special forces. So I was sort of almost sort of um, sort of full circle coming back to that sort of mentorship role again. Um, in Dubai sounds, you know, it's it sounds great to everyone. And when I first got out there, um, it was one of my best mates who got me the sort of job out there. Um, and he sort of said to me, he goes, look, he goes, what I do, he goes, every time I sneeze, he goes, I always check my hands to make sure my brain is not in my hands. Right. Um, and I was laughing because what he means is out there we were only using sort of 5% brain power. Right. Because we could do this all day long on a great tax-free wage, um, not exactly working too hard out there. But the key was, you know, don't get complacent. Yeah. You know, this job, you could, this job's for life. Yeah. Uh, however... Make sure that your brain, your little yeah. nugget, is not in your hand when you sneeze because you know then that you need to be thinking about other stuff. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So coming back to that piece about normal and not mm. being able to sort of, you know, I suppose it's a choice, isn't it? You're not mm. accepting normal. You're mm. saying, I'm, I'm in pursuit of ven- adventure mm-hmm. and, um, you, you, you know, you like that. Bring in, I just want to touch on Ray at the minute, Ray Carroll, mm. if you could yeah. just explain Ray Carroll because... Yeah. A lot of the material in your in, in your book, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, the clinic and, 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 and what you're standing for mm-hmm. now as you go forward as an author, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some super stupid stuff that you're putting together mm-hmm. and, um, you know, uh, promoting. And I know you've got a couple of things mm-hmm. coming as well, so, mm-hmm. some adventures. Yeah. And the way you're yeah. going to promote this book is really... <laughs> Really yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. and I love it actually because once again, yeah. it's not the normal, right? No, it's not, no. you, you know. Um, but equally, do you find now that with your writing, um, mm. that you are expressing that venture, so you, you're mentally putting yourself in those situations? And I'm not going to give too much away because I let people read the book, um, because I think that's important. But is that because that's taking you on a journey anyway with your imagination, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the fiction you're writing. Yeah? yeah, I mean, again, it's, you know, in Dubai, again, lo and behold, the brain was in my hand and I just needed something else to stimulate me. I sort of thought, actually, performance coaching was what I was actually trained in. I thought, actually, I'm going to write some sort of performance book mm. based on the expedition, mm. some bring out some sort of narrative around that. But I just thought, oh, this crap is, you know, I just didn't float my boat. I just thought about fiction. I just thought about, actually, how can I sort of my journey of this lone man in Antarctica, okay, what's he actually searching for? Okay, um, you know, how can I use this about this lone ex sort of SAS sergeant down there on his own? And that's when I switched to fiction. I thought, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a book um, about this guy on his own, actually based on my expedition, but this guy is paranoid. You know, he's um, have I got PTSD? Is it just exposure? Is this Ray? Yeah, no, this is no, this, this is Decker. It's the Decker, Harry right. Decker. So I just did the clinic book. So that was how the initial fit, uh, idea was inspired. Um, and the aim then, once I got the idea in my head, was the metric for success. Let's just write a novel yourself, okay? Right. Um, let's not think about Waterstones, book deals, movies. Wouldn't it be great to write your own novel or set up for a trilogy? So that was the challenge, and it was a hard one. I mean, I'm easily, um, intellectually, the hardest I've ever come across. And I, I would compare it, obviously different comparables, to anything physical I've done, to actually that staying power. 
to finish it because I want to give up so many times really and get someone else to finish it off um, was something I'm incredibly proud of. Yes. Um, so that's how sort of I evolved into you know the the fiction book, fiction writing, and again you probably want to touch on Ray Carroll. Yes. So my initial plan was to be in the shadows, uh, have a pseudonym um, called Ray Carroll, which is named after my granddad who's Ray and my mum who's Carol, and they're both not with us. So that was sort of a, an emotion. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. an emotional connection because you've got, it, again, in my mindset, I've got I'm dealing with two different people then because you know, Ray Carroll, I'll say it's, it's the business side, but I really know what that character is all about. So I was going to remain in the shadows, uh, face sort of um, not shown and just write fiction because um, that's the way I wanted it to be. But as things evolved, I realised that my passion was really, and I talk about this authenticity, this passion, this drive. I realised then that actually I've got a lot of real genuine stuff to offer people. Mm-hmm. And I can't do that through, I can do it through writing, but this day and age, you, the medium has got to be, as we are now, yeah. um, face-to-face. I've got to have that interaction. And, you know, I can't give these sort of, like, um, soundbite videos of the classic Andy McNabb in the shadows where no one can see who you are. Yes. You need to have this eye contact. You need to yes. be able to express yourself with that yes. passion. Yes. So I then obviously move more into sort of like performance um, sort of um, products in, in journals. So then I like the Ray Carroll brand. I was stuck with it really. If I could go back, I'd just be Chris Foote. But now it's not, it's not, um, it's not unknown territory. It's a pen name, Ray Carroll. Um, any performance products I sort of bring out, um, all my sound bites. It's just that's my brand now. Mm. Um, I like it. At the end of the day, people who know me might get mixed up between the two sort of brands. Of, why are you? What, why are you used to call yourself Christopher? And I'm like, it doesn't matter to you lot. You know, the four or five thousand people that follow me, they know me as Ray Carroll. Okay, they mm. don't care on Chris Foot in real life. Okay, mm. they know Ray, and hopefully they like Ray. Um, and that's where. I just, in like most things in life, I'm pretty stubborn. And I don't really care what you think. So it must be interesting, <laughs> isn't it? You're sort of getting up on a morning, today I'm Ray, and I'm going to get down to some, you know, some work and start doing some writing yeah. and, 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 and... I mean, I'm lucky of... that the, 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 the characters are the same, so, which is, you know, we talked about this in the car, didn't we? Um, yeah. Is in, there's not an alter ego there, which is great. It's not like, okay, wake up as Ray, let's get like Mr. the Mr. Motivator guy, let's get the real yeah. sort of hard-boiled... Um, former special forces right. guy. It's uh, this is the this is the expedition bloke. It's not. They're the same characters, different names, but for the brand, it's you know it's it's sort of Ray Carroll. Um, well, I think I think the thing that's come across uh, you know all morning, uh, Chris, is is the, the the word that you've used just a couple of times. But I think it's important with the times we live in now, genuine. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you guys, if you don't mind me saying this, the S, the SAS, there's a lot of like kind of fiction out there right now. Mm. If you don't mind me saying it's mm. been it's been sort of plagiarized. as almost like rock star celebrity status. Mm. And one of the things I've picked up with yourself and I think your books, you know, your book, particularly the, the, the recent one, um, really reflect sort of a skill and a half of being able mm. to dedicate yourself mm. to a sense of completion, mm-hmm. beginning a book, you know, finishing yeah. a book. Going to you know all these expeditions that you're going mm. and the adventures you're going, mm. the beginning and the end. It's about yeah. completion. Yes. It's about sticking with it. Mm. And if I think back about how I've got to know you, is you know I set off on this journey at uh, the train station, mm. and it's still going. That train yeah. is still going. Yeah, uh, I might have got off, but I've got back on, and yeah. we're still going somewhere else. So dare I say it, the best is yet to come. And I think, you know, one of the things that. I really like about this story because I, I, I'm, di- I'm dying for you to talk about how you're going to promote the book. <laughs> yeah? yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important here. Um, and I know that you've got a big venture coming up back end yeah. of the year as well. So can yeah. we can we zero yeah. in on that? Yeah. And, yeah. And that, that train you're talking about, I like to sort of, yeah, I, I, it's definitely a freight train. Yeah. You know, you're not going to stop that train mm. fast. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, you it's a slow mover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's for sure. But you're not going to stop yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it goes back to, I wrote the book for the right reasons, the novel. Mm-hmm. Um, again, a big thing, as you said, it's all about start the metric for success. Okay, it's not about a number one bestseller to me. It was about the process of me doing that. Because we know that 99% of... The journey. Yeah, 99% will get ghostwriters in and they talk about their you know, plot points, etc. And it's done. But that's not me. It's never going to be me. The reward's not there. Okay, and it's just fraud at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. It's quite... Yeah. Um, 
And we, we talked about this adventure. And so, yeah, clearly I'm not with a mainstream publisher. Okay, so that you know, my book's not marketed all around the world or you're not going to see it at an airport. You know, when airports, you know, up, get to back to full capacity, you're not going to see it in Waterstones. But I'm like, I'm proud of this book. Okay, it took me a long time to write it. And I yeah. think it's good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I agree. It, you know, yeah. and it's a, a complex plot, but it's good. It's mine. Okay, so mm. I'm like that. Well, I'll tell you what. I haven't got a big publisher behind me, you know, and the people aren't coming to me. Yeah, I'll take it to the people. Fantastic. So I've come up with this um, idea where I'm going to get on my Brompton bike um, and I'm going to do the world's worst ever book signing tour. Right, OK. Around the coast of England, probably. We're going to start off with, you know, sort of England. And, and, and the, the premise is very simple. It's, you know, it's me on a Brompton bike, probably with a suit jacket on, a little satchel, a couple of books in it, you know, pen down my sock. And do 60 to 80 miles a day and stop at a pub, which we know that I'm coming. Um, if it's to keep um, within sort of the, the theme of it being the world's worst ever book sign and so hopefully no one will be there. Because <laughs> that's, that's the idea. But the idea is there will be people there. Yeah, of course. And in the journey in itself, um, again, it's set up really to write uh, my first, say, non-fiction style book. And right. It's not only the quirky adventure itself. It's, again, me sort of giving my sort of golden nuggets of, you know, how I'm, where I am. And, you know, it's the, you know, it's the all about ideas, ambition, trying to help people into how they decide what their ideas are. How do yes. they turn it into an ambition? How do they achieve it? You know, not mm. getting carried away with these ridiculous metrics. Let's keep to starting something and finishing it, no matter how big or small. And hopefully on on this journey, I want to, like, obviously nowhere near as good as this podcast set up, <laughs> but it would be nice to interview the unsung heroes yes. of, of the local, whether it's the local village. You know, we all have the old local legends who, you know, drink in the pub and, oh, that guy over there, you know. Got a get, story. Get yeah. these really great natural sort of stories from the normal public as opposed to our sort of A-listers or yeah, Z-listers, yeah. really crap reality TV stars. So yeah. there's lots of moving parts to it. <laughs> That's my idea at the moment. It's a book about the world's worst ever book signing tour. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally making it up as I sort of go along. But, I, just, you know, the, 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 the content, I hope, is going to be it's going to be good. And as you touched on before, it's just me sort of shooting from the hip. Um, you know, you cross the line and you see where it's going to go. It's fantastic. Um, I love the sort of like to our listeners and viewers, the sort of if we start something, we finish something. Mm. And that right goes back, you know, right through the whole artery of this, mm. you know, conversation that we've had over the last couple yeah. of hours and obviously specifically over yeah. the last number yeah. of minutes on this podcast. But you, you, you're moving on and, and you're going to uh, you're planning another a big trip mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you're going on another expedition. And I've got some notes here. 90 days. Yep. Yeah, and it's 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 pulling a sleigh of 160k, which is the equivalent of 25 stone. It's going to take 10 to 12 hours a day, burning 7,000 calories, total distance 1,600 miles. Is that right? No support. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and and and, and there's a there's a so my big question in the car was, how do you prepare for this? And you said you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, as I said before, it's a, I've, I've, obviously I've done expeditions with those sort of uh, weight before, and it's you just need a real solid base foundation. You know, right. you haven't got to be super fit. Back to uh, the basics then, yeah? Absolutely, just getting those foundations. I mean, I reckon, I mean, me and my best mate joke about this, I reckon I do the same workout that I was taught when I was 16 at the Haven hotel right this old guy guy come over knew i was training for the marines tried teaching me how to train i just like look mate i'm, I'm not interested seriously son i need to sit you down i know what i'm talking about and he taught me all these workouts which i still do to this day and and, and i probably will do those workouts again when it comes to weight but it is just yeah having that base level of uh, sort of cardio obviously you need to be sort of fit and strong robust but like anything, you you know, you can't train to pull a hundred and sixty kilogram sled or, you know, what's the equivalent of an iron bath full up with water, you know, and you're dragging it across the snow. You can pull some tires, do stuff like that. But it's just something which is it's there's no way of getting around it. It's absolutely hard, it's nails. But you just gotta make sure your body is robust enough, it's at a decent level of fitness. Um and like anything with these, you're going nowhere unless you're doing it for the right reasons. Right. You know, this is not, you know, 90 days, 1,600 miles across Antarctica. You know, it's not a vanity project. You know, yeah. it will, you know, you, the cracks will appear straight away. This is not sort of a fame and fortune. This is unfinished business, actually. You're right. So, because <laughs> I didn't get to achieve what I wanted to because of the externals out of my control, the window wasn't there. 
Mm-hmm. Every year I see people do expeditions and I just want a piece of it. Yeah. I literally, I don't wish failure on anyone, but I've got to admit when people do stuff, you're like, well, yeah, fair play to you, you've done that. But there's also that little sort of bit of pill. Actually, where's my legacy? I want my, it, it was taken from me. Yeah. In, in all honesty, because I'm stubborn, yeah. it is unfinished business. I yeah. need <laughs> it's therapy. Yes. I need to get down there. 1,600 miles is pretty much the last challenge down there, which could be physically And possible. you're on your own, is that right? Yeah, so no support. So how it works, you fly into a base camp. I get flown to the edge of the ice cap um, with all my kit and equipment. Obviously, you've got like a satellite phone for emergencies. And then that's you off you jolly well sort of trot, um, you know, across the sort of the, the, the ice caps, through, through the South Pole and out the other side. And again, it's, it's 1,600 miles. Um, and wow. I can't really beef it up any more than that. It's, there's, no, there's no real excitement about it. Uh, you know, if anyone can get excited about pulling a 160-kilogram sled 1,600 miles, then I reckon you need to interview them to find out what's going on in their <laughs> it, mind. It, it, it's, it's interesting because I think when you're with yourself like that, and I know that you know we're coming to a conclusion now on our, our podcast, and this has been mm. fascinating. And one thing, that freight train called Genuine, mm. is really a really nice artery mm. here. You must be in a kind of constant state. Of, you're almost like meditating all the way through because you're in this flow state in some capacity, just eating yeah. away the miles as you yeah. just like, you know, and you, you must get that sort of when you get there, so to speak, that sense of total completion. I've made it. It's, it's an, in, so the, the interesting thing about it, I managed to sort of get the, the funding to do this. Now, the last expedition I'd done, because it was so on the cuff in last minute I got the money yeah. in, I literally had to borrow my mate's iPod. So, really? So he put a load of music. Anyway, anyway, the iPod broke after about two days. That's the big iPod. And all I was yeah. left with was a shuffle, which had like 60 minutes of hard house sort of workout <laughs> music. So... Wow. Two days into a potentially a 65-day expedition, I only had the shuffle, so I had nothing to listen to. So now you hear about the audio books and, you know, all the libraries of music. Now, in Antarctica as well, not only are you, you know, trying to drag this, you know, iron bath behind you, some days you have whiteouts, you can't see anything by the tips of your skis, and you've got a bracket on you with your compass. And obviously you're just following your compass, you can't see nothing. Now... If you imagine that now. You, you you've got no music, you know. You're absolutely dying in agony. You can't see where you're going. You're tripping over all the time, and you just sort of keep going. Um, so that was the experience I had then. And one of the main reasons for the expedition was how do I form this sort of masterclass in my own mind, a mental masterclass, so I can then impart that knowledge. Um, wow. Now, to my disappointment, I fell short. All the strategies I thought I could use down there to then say, oh, yeah, that one works as a good sort of sports psychology strategy. I'm going to use that. It wasn't everything. It was just chaos, a riot inside my head. Can't control it. Stop. You want to break down. I even think I think I, think I did try crying once. Um, that didn't work. You know, right. <laughs> you know and, wow. and, but then you realize suddenly it, it just goes. It's quiet. Then. And then, you, then, then the mind starts thinking, how did I get rid of that? And by the time you start thinking about how you got rid of it, it's back again. So, right. so, okay. so, so there are certain strategies how to approach each day being so hard. But it's all down to if you're doing something for the right reasons, you will put yourself, you will put up with the pain, you'll put up for the suffering. You know, you'll keep the eye on the prize. OK, you've you got to come back into yourself every time, every hour, possibly every minute on some days. But as long as you've got that burning desire that you're down there for the right reasons then that freight train just keeps slowly, slowly sort of ploughing through the snow. Um, that's amazing. I mean, I think that's all, you know, we use a lot of language now, purpose, meaning, greater good. But this is the real deal, isn't it? You're yeah. actually, you're up against your per- you and your purpose in mm. harmony mm. that creates the sort of unseen drive that just keeps you one step in front of the other with the fundamentals at heart, you know, keeping, mm. keeping it simple. You, you know, one of the things, Chris, I found fascinating about our story today, and maybe we didn't touch on it right now, is the, the two key things after 10 minutes of talking to you was about authenticity mm-hmm. yeah. and simplicity. Yeah. You were all, you're all about simplicity, aren't you? Yeah, again, it's, you know, where do you, you know, I'm not even going to step into the wisdom side of things, but you always take things away from experiences. And, yeah. and as I said before, everything... I do, you know, basics done well. Now, complexity, 
Okay, just through say experience being in say you know um, special forces or complexity causes confusion. Too many moving parts. Too many you know there's t- too much scope for error. Confusion. Simplicity withstands pressure. The simple basics will always withstand pressure. So for me, it's not a mantra. It, it could be a mantra in life. I just look at things. I don't try and fancy anything up. Let's just do the basics well. Because yeah. I know through past experiences, Beautiful. it's you know it's going to survive all the pressure that comes with it. Brilliant, um, and that's sort of the how secret. I see it. The secret, you know, Chris, um, um, uh, you know, um, Elias, Ray, Ray Carroll. Carol. I I kind of want to just say a massive thank you. What a journey! And to be honest, um, you know, the last couple of decades of your life, I know it's mm. the best is yet to come, and you know, the very best of luck at becoming a world-class author, because I know that's on its way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the book, The Clinic, you know, Chris Fro- you know, Chris Foote and um, Ray Carroll. Reach out, guys. Read this. This is, a, this is an amazing guy. He keeps things simple, applying the brilliant basics in life. That's the message. Mm-hmm. And he's living testimony to just basically zoning in on yourself and that self-belief and that unwavering determination to mm. succeed at whatever you set out to succeed. And I think the word is completion. If you'd start something, endeavour to complete it. What a great message. Chris, I just want to say a massive thank you. And to all our viewers and listeners today, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, but once again, an amazing podcast from Silent Ego, the soul of the entrepreneur, life beyond the spreadsheet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.